visitation of God is one thing. But uh, having making a habitation for God is a completely different thing. You recall with me in the Old Testament there was a woman there in, in um, the Old Testament who, whose house on a consistent basis it was that the prophet passed by. The Bible tells us that she makes bread for him. You've got to understand this. The price that we pay to get God to stop by is not the price that we pay to get God to stay longer. Wow. Amen. So she begins to cook bread because she's appreciative of the fact that he's going to pass by ever so often. But she desires for this prophet to remain longer. So what does she do? She builds a home for him or she builds a room. She builds a room, she and her family, to the back of her house. She attaches that room to her house. And the rhetorical question may be why. Because seeing him and being near him occasionally was no longer enough. Amen. Amen. She wanted him to be just as close as he could, and she wanted to be as close as she could. And so what, what we are seeing now is a growing level of anticipation of not just the, the visitation of God, but rather a habitation that we are making for God. Amen. Amen. I found something interesting this morning in Matthew chapter 4, verse number 1. I want to make sure that everybody knows how appreciative we are that you're here. And this is a massive uh, chair. It doesn't look like that, so these are not just um, cool pillows that my wife uses. These are necessary to keep me from falling in, and if I fell in this chair... Uh, the camera probably wouldn't be able to pick me up. All you would see is my feet. So thank God for these effeminate pillows around a masculine man. <laughs> Matthew chapter 4, verse number 1. I'm very comfortable with these effeminate pillows today. <laughs> then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward and hungry. And when the tempter came to tempt him, or came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. I want to kind of dig into these scriptures today and talk from a very simplistic train of thought concerning friendship and worship that may be useful to a lot of you. And we'll come up with a title in just a little while. On a Wednesday night not too long ago, we asked two rhetorical questions. Uh, basically, that is, how do I get to know God and how does God get to know me? And I want to kind of just delve back into that and, and share with you not only the law of first mention, but the intent of the Creator. If we can find the law of first mention, if we can find the, the intent of the Creator, we can understand Him more. Amen. And if you understand Him more, you'll, you'll see Him differently. If you see Him differently, you'll understand Him more. Amen. And all of these things are going to work synergistically so as to help us in our worship. Amen. Yes, sir. I am convinced that if in this hour we want to get to know God, we've got to start with worship. Amen. Amen. That's got to be um, the core theme. That's got to be ever so centralized in our heart. Worship, though, is not merely just singing. Worship is not just, is, is not just talking to God or talking about God. All those, those things are very important. So I want, to, I want to just talk on a couple of things as a couple of points, and we're just going to slowly wade into that. Who do we worship? And how do we worship? Do these things really matter? In the States, you and I obviously are not a part of a monarchical system. We, we understand to a certain degree we, that there is proper protocol to the presence of someone who is sovereign. We look and see on the news now, and, and uh, we know that the queen is still alive. And if you're going to have the opportunity to step into the presence of the queen, you're going to have to know the protocol of the queen. So there, you, you're not just going to just allow anybody to step into the presence of the queen. There's going to be 
uh, parameters that that certain people can only get so close to and if you if you're a man you're going to bow in her presence if you're a woman you're going to curtsy in her presence you're not going to lift your head higher than her head if, if she's looking at the ground do not be looking in the sky and if she's looking eye to eye you can look eye to eye but it's best that you look a little bit lower than her eyes yet I find it ironic that so oftentimes when we preach and teach and tell people about the king of kings we seem to have forgotten his sovereignty we seem to have forgotten his righteousness we seem to have forgotten how holy he is and that he is our creator he he certainly is above the queen and so I'm not really sure how it is that we began to dumb down the protocol uh, rather I'm not so sure how it was that we felt comfortable dumbing down our approach to the presence of God and we so oftentimes tell people you can come anywhere any way that you want you can do anything that you want and I have a friend that calls about every five years without exaggeration and he wants to make sure that I still believe in the doctrine as though the doctrine and his presence are, uh, are, are exactly the same thing. You can believe in, in the doctrine all that you want, but if you're not in the presence of God, that doctrine is not going to help you. Amen. And the question is each time every five years, and it's been about 15 years now, so three different times I've received this phone call is, if I come to your church, can I wear shorts and, and tank top and hmm. and can I wear sandal open sandals? And my response is the same as number one, I don't have a church. Right. And number two is, is is since you knew God at one specific time, why in the world would you think it was okay to just come in? When you go to your job, you wear specific clothing. Yeah. When when you go before uh, 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 the the um, the court locally for some trials and some tribulations that he's went through. Why in the world uh, did you dress up and wear a suit there? But when you come to the presence of God, you want to see just how casual you can be and how lackadaisical you can be. And so our normal response is, yeah, it doesn't matter how you, you come to God, but I want to tell you it matters how we come to God. Amen. 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 The first thing that I want to stress to us today, and I think that we should stress... I'm going to stay away from the pandemic a little bit today because we've really covered that in depth, is that man was created to worship his creator. Amen. In God's creation of man on earth, he did something. He gave man a wheel. And that wheel seems to be the most difficult thing that we can battle. If you want to go into spiritual warfare, stop looking at Satan. Stop looking at the neighbor. Stop. Don't go into the clubs to try and find Satan. Don't go into the world and try and find Satan. Go into the bathroom. Turn the light on. Look in the mirror. Stay there for a few seconds, and you'll find out your greatest adversary is your personal will. Amen. It's probably the greatest battle that you'll ever have is the battle of your own will. That's, and that's why Christ Jesus said, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Amen. We've got to get to a place where we trust God enough that we can say, you know what, my will looks good to me, and logistically everything makes sense, but I don't trust my heart. I don't trust my mind. I don't trust my own will. I'm going to set down my will. Why? Because I saw the greatest example in the Word of God when Jesus Christ did the same thing. And hey, if I want the same results then why don't I do the things, the patterns in which he, he has shown us? There's a protocol for the presence of God there. Amen. The Bible says this, that in heaven, Lucifer became exalted within himself. Lucifer saw this worship going to God, and Lucifer wanted that worship for himself. <laughs> he wanted the very worship that he was created to offer to God. He saw... Uh, the, the, the hearts of humanity saw, if you will, uh, uh, really it was the hearts of, uh, of others at that specific time, which were the angels. He saw them worshiping God. Later he will see the hearts of humanity when worshiping God. But he sees the angels as the angels are worshiping God. And, and we know the story that he is evicted from heaven. And now, if you will, there is metaphorically this empty spot in heaven. 
And so I find it really neat sometimes to look at the Word of God through different lenses and not necessarily the lens that your Sunday school teacher taught you. Again, with the flannel graph and all of that stuff that still doesn't make sense today. God's not into fairy tales, but the, the, yeah, actually use the Word of God as your protocol and as your lens, and you'll be surprised at what's in there. Yes, sir. So you ask yourself the question then, if, if God wants to get back at Satan, if God really wants to push the buttons of Lucifer, how would he do it? Well, he would create humanity. He would create man. The very place that Lucifer now resides in, in the earthly realm, the very place that God evicted him from heaven and cast him down into, God said, oh, I know how to push your button. I'm going to create man. And I'm going to put a free will inside of him. And I'm going to let him set down that wheel and worship me right in front of you so that all of the days of your life, you're going to see what you lost. Wow. wow. There is this garden and there's this beautiful, delightful place. And it is, it's a beautiful union that we see together between the creation and the creator. And what I've taught you in the past is that when the creation is in right standing with the Creator, when man is in right standing with God, and man is truly worshiping God on a consistent basis, and man is loyal to God, it is the greatest sense of warfare. It is the greatest and the most egregious attack that you can serve on the enemy. It's just to allow that enemy, force that enemy to see you in constant fellowship with God. And I want to tell you, you'll be more successful in warfare than if you spent 24 hours in prayer and fasting, calling out every demon, every, every fallen angel. I want you to understand that when you think of warfare, oftentimes when I think of warfare, I'm thinking about yelling and screaming in this impassionate, anointed prayer meeting. And sometimes that's very needed. But warfare in its greatest form, there's a protocol. It's called worship. So when you worship your Creator, you are creating warfare right before Satan's very eyes. So, so if you want to get back at the enemy, it's not just being religious. You want to get back at the enemy, let him see you. Make him see you worship God. Amen. Call him. You ever thought about calling him to the place of worship? Wow. Having a bad day? I don't want everybody to do this, but have you ever thought about if you're having a bad day but you're in right standing with God? Call out Satan. Tell that devil to come watch this. Pull a chair up and say, sit down there, sucker, just for a minute and watch this. I'm going to show you what you lost and you'll never get back. And then you just lift your hands and you begin to worship the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And you look at the devil who you can't see, but you look there and you let him know... I'm going to show you how to worship. There's no music. There's no song. There's no preaching. But I love my Creator who created me to fellowship with Him. And why in the world would I want anything less than friendship and fellowship with my Creator? Amen. To think that the God of this universe, the God that created us all, wants to fellowship with us? That's all He wanted from, 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 from Adam. He shows up in the cool of the day, the cool of the eve. Adam, where, where, where are you? And, and, and Adam is over there hiding from his creator. How could you describe that situation? If you had a bird's eye view and you were there, and we could go back and take a, a, a recorder there, a video camera there, and record Adam hiding from the creator. But I'd like to see it from the perspective of the Creator looking down into the garden and seeing the one that you love. Seeing the one that was representing, representing you, mirroring you on earth, now hiding from you. So why would you talk about worship? Why, why is this such a uh, continual theme in most churches? I think the answer is simple. If I don't have a proper perspective on God, then my worship is going to be off. Amen. Amen. If I don't know who He is, then my worship is not going to be, number one, fulfilling to me, and it's not going to be fulfilling to God. If I think of God here, and I'm worshiping at this level, but God is way up on this level, am I truly worshiping God? Or am I worshiping 
my own image of God. Wow. wow. So proper perspective of God is necessary at many levels in life. If you had a chance and you were to go back one scripture before, one text before in John chapter 3, that's where we're going to see or where we saw the baptism of Jesus Christ. What a different baptism that must have been. Yes, I mean, sir. that baptism didn't look like any other baptism. In fact, John was no dummy. John was like, I... I prefer not to do this if that's okay. <laughs> He's looking at the one who, uh, you know, when he was a child was in Mary's womb. And when, when Mary stepped into Elizabeth's house, you know, the story turned. And we talked about that, that actual it meant in Hebrew, that, that turning. And, and so he knows who this is right here. But this baptism was more of a ceremonial preparation. Wow. Yes, sir. He's baptized. He's about to be recognized to all humanity. He is baptized, and the Bible lets us know that the heavens opened over him. Uh, really, it says the heavens opened unto him, and the Spirit of God descended upon him, watch this, like a dove, lighting upon him. The reason I believe, and I've taught this as well, but I want to get this into some sweet people today. One of the reasons I believe that this is theologically important is simply because of what we know about that second dove on Noah's Ark. That second dove on Noah's Ark was released, but it never returns back to the Ark. The second dove did not return to the first Ark. What was it? It was symbolically looking for another Ark. A greater ark. The first ark in the water saved eight souls. Are you with me? Yes, yes sir. But first Peter tells us about baptism into the name of Jesus Christ. Said tells us the light figure wherein to even baptism doth also now save us. Amen. Noah's ark saved eight people. This new ark is going to save whosoever will. Amen. Amen. So you, you've got to see this, that that first dove left and found no place to rest. That's why it didn't come back. But symbolically, it comes back now in, in, in the, the Testament of Matthew, in Testament of John, when John is baptizing Jesus, the heavens open, and all of a sudden, here comes that dove. <laughs> and, it found, and it found somebody, and it found some place that it could rest. Amen, amen, amen. amen. Remember this, that God was in the ark telling, telling Adam to come in. Remember that? Yes, sir. And so we're, we're doing like a lot of rehab here. We're just kind of going back and building it up a little bit better. But listen, God was in that first ark telling, telling um, 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 Noah, rather, to, to come on in. I wrote in my notes that God was in the ark telling Moses to come in. Maybe he was. I don't know. I didn't see that in the Bible. But God was in the ark telling, telling Noah to, to come in. Now we see God in Christ Jesus. It's the same phraseologies. Remember when Peter is on the water? Yes, sir. Jesus, if that's you. John just told him it was him. Yes, he said, Jesus, if that's you, bid me to come. What does Jesus say? Oh, come on. What do you mean? Same words. Same words. You think Peter, <laughs> who's walking towards the second ark, is going to be in more danger than Noah who walked into the first ark? So when it appears that the storm and appears the wind and appears that the water is going to overtake him, Jesus saved him. That's why he says that baptism doth now also save us. How could you not want to be this God's friend. Amen. How could you want to disassociate yourself from God in a pandemic and a storm and a trial? Not if you know Him. And that's why I'm saying we've got to have a proper perspective of God. We've got to understand what God wants. Amen. In Matthew chapter 4 here, Jesus is led of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the tempter, or to be tempted by the devil. He doesn't eat for 40 days. He doesn't eat for 40 nights. He's hungry. That's when the tempter shows up. And the first two letters out of that, that tempter's mouth is, if, if you're really the Son of God, command these stones to be made bread. What's his attack? What, what's, what's the adversary attacking here? 
the exact same thing that he was attacking in the garden. He's attacking his fellowship with his creator. He's wow. attacking his fellowship with his father. He is attacking his connection with his creator. His first attack on humanity was to disrupt the intimacy that man had with God. Wow. His first attack on Jesus Christ in the garden is to disrupt the fellowship that Jesus has with the Father. Amen. Wow. Why is that? I told you when we started today. Because he's seeing somebody who's in perfect unison, in perfect unity with the Father. He's seeing somebody who is representing what he saw in heaven. He is seeing someone who is re-imaging the likeness of the Father. And he is seeing the express image of the one that was in heaven. And he hates it because now he sees somebody who for the first time is truly mirroring heaven. Amen. 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 It's the last thing that he wants to see on earth. Right. So what, what's the last thing that he wants to see in your life? You to fulfill the very purpose for which you were created. Amen. Wow. Not to sing, not to preach, not to exercise in gifts. If you were to just look at the church church today, you would think that miracle signs and wonders, by the way we preach it, is what it's all about. Some people are convinced that's what it's all about. I thought it was about worship. Wow. Yes, sir. I wonder what would happen if you took all of the miracle signs and wonders out of our dictionary. Do you know this? You'd still have equal amount of miracle signs and wonders as long as you believe that. Amen. Yes, sir. Amen. Why? Because if you preach Jesus Christ yes, sir. and the kingdom of God, I want to tell you these signs shall follow them that believe. Amen. He didn't Amen. say you had to go everywhere and tell everybody. I'm going to pull a billboard out. I believe in God for miracle signs and wonders. Good. I've been believing that since before I, I, I was saved. Amen. I'm not going to diminish that miracle signs and wonders are not things that we need. We all need those. Yes, yes, but sir. what I'm going to tell you is, is that our focus must be upon Jesus. Amen. 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 So what you're going to see in these temptations of Jesus, you're going to see these uh, this unwavering love, this unwavering loyalty, this unwavering unity. And it's so different and it's so dynamic and it's so unique in the earth. It's so different that it was intimidating to the devil. Wow. Mm -hmm. Why, do, why would you want to be different than the church down the street? I just want to blend in, not me. I want to stick out. Yes, Amen. I want to stick out like a sore thumb to him. I want to Amen. look like a loaded shotgun in the face of the enemy. Whenever <laughs> yes, I walk sir. into the atmosphere, the first thing I want him to see and the last thing I want him to see when I leave that atmosphere and when I leave that arena is that I'm as loyal to Jesus in private as I am in public. Amen. I am as committed to Jesus in public as I am in yes. private. Amen. I don't want him to come to my prayer room and say, oh, you're a different person in here than you are out there. Wow. Yes, sir. See, if you're, if you're a double-minded man, you're, you're not intimidating to the enemy. Why is that? Because you look like him when you're double-minded. The Bible says that a double-minded man is unstable in all of his way. So how do you work your way out of being unstable? How do you work your way out of being double-minded? Stop fellowshipping with the world. Start fellowshipping with the one that created you. That's what he wanted in the very beginning. Amen. So, uh, I've recently been connected this last week with with a, uh, a small amount of childhood friends, and it's been fascinating. It's 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 been really neat. I've noticed that uh, about twelve to fifteen of them have remained friends since like elementary school. They're still all best friends today. <laughs> they they they. I was thinking about how amazing that would be to have not moved off, and but our paths were totally different, and to have childhood friends that you grow up with, and you're adults, and you're you're more than thirty, uh, and less and less than fifty, a little bit. <laughs> what would that be like? And, and so I started asking questions, and I started listening to what they have to say, and some of the things that he would, they would say would be, we we try and get together as often as we can. Conrad told me, he said, hey, hey Cook, we ride bikes with these, with these guys every weekend. In other words, friends look for opportunities to get together. Friends create events. Friends create hobbies so that they can have an excuse to spend time with one another. Mm -hmm. are, you, are you with me? Yes, yes sir. I think that's, that's something that's near and dear to the heart of God as well. 
to think about in your day what you can create, a, a, a hobby, an environment, a time where you eat, a time where you do whatever it is that you're going to do, but purposely create and set aside that time, give it to God and say, let's, when I'm eating, let's spend time together. Wow. When I'm in the shower, let's spend time together. Mm -hmm. And what happens is, if you start out in the shower and say, hey, let's spend time together, I can just think about you in the shower and worship you. Uh, before long, uh, when you're, you're drying off, you'll want to worship Him. And That's before right. long, you'll say, hey, that wasn't long enough. I'm about to go to lunch. Could you be with me again at lunch? And what happens is, is you are creating events and opportunities. And before long, you'll find out that your day consists of and is enraptured with and is totally focused upon a worshiping God. Yes. Amen. 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 And the coolest thing is, is that God created you to be like that. So let me reel this in some because we've got a long ways to go. The law of first mention. You may have heard me say that before. That's God's original plan. That's God's original idea. That's His intent. That's the way that He set it up. And, and I've told you that God is never going to miss the mark because missing the mark means sin. So whatever God did in the, in, in the beginning, even though we may not be seeing it right now, I can assure you He's going to get it in the end. Amen. Because He won't miss His mark. When it, what did He want in the beginning? He wanted fellowship. He wanted friendship. He wanted communion. He wanted worship. Has that changed? No, no sir. So let's just say that 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 there's only been about uh, let's just say there's only four to six thousand years, depending upon people's interpretation, between um, Adam's time and now. No arguing. Just let's just throw that out there. How many friends has God had? In the last 4,000 years. We talk about how many friends this person has. But how many, how many friends has God had? You ever look at it from that perspective? Well, I know that Adam walked with God for a while, and Abraham did, and Isaac did, and Jacob did. They all had, there were time frames, though, that they were. David. Last week we talked about Caleb. Caleb, last week or the week before. We went into detail about, about what it meant that, to be a dog. Do you remember that? Well, you need to also know, first and foremost, that he was an Israeli spy. He is being sent out. And, and um, when he goes out and he's looking into the promised land, he sees, like others, the possibility of the sons of uh, Anakim. He knows that they're out there, the sons of Anak. Uh, but uh, the, the neatest thing was is that when he came back, as I told you, that he, he told others, listen, these giants and these inhabitants, they're bred to us. He was trying to get everybody to step out on the word of God, step into the promised land, and do whatever we've got to do. God's going to be there to help us destroy these giants. He's yes, about 40 years of age when he spies out the land and he sees this one mountain. This one mountain has caught his attention and it's going to keep his attention for the next 45 years. When everybody else besides he and Joshua say, no, we can't, he's going to, to walk around that generation as they are dying off. He's telling this other generation about this specific mountain. Yes, sir. For 40-something years, he's telling everybody about this mountain. I know there's a mountain. I've seen it. I know that I've heard the stories and I know this and I know that. So later on, we're going to find out that the name of this mountain is Kerjith um, Arba. And, and what that means is, number one, it's, it's, it, it, it was conquered and it was um, then named by the greatest giant of the Anakim at that time. He names the mountain after himself. And the name of that mountain means four cities. When, when you research that, you, you could say, well, yeah, it meant this, 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 and this. But the Jewish scholars, many, many scholars tell us the reason why it was named four cities is because Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and a real old man by the name of Adam were buried there. Wow. 
and Caleb knew that. It's the very place where Abram's name was changed to Abraham. This list goes on and on. We're going to see Absalom later mess with David. All of that. But these four men, from the perspective of Caleb, these four men were friends of God. These four men walked with God. At times in their life, they had face-to-face -face encounters with God. And they were buried there. And Caleb never allowed this mountain to leave his mind for 40 plus years his heart was fixed upon this mountain later on at 85 years of age you've heard it preached he goes into Joshua at that time and he says not give me a mountain but he said Joshua I want you to remember this land that belonged to me I want you to remember this mountain give me this mountain so he goes into that region, he and some other he and some other men. He goes into that region. He drives out the inhabitants. He defeats at least three of the sons of Anak. He conquers the land. He 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 renames the mountain. What did he rename the mountain to? He called it Mount. Hebron, which means the mountain of friendship. Wow. For 45 years, he has been talking to people about what it's like to be a friend of God. For 40, that's why the Bible said that he had a different spirit. He was a friend that was walking with God for 45 years in the, the wilderness. Being a friend of God and establishing that place on top of the mountain is probably what kept Caleb all of those years while all of the doubters, all of the murmurs, and all of the complainers were being killed off. Caleb knew that if I'll just hang in here, God's Word will not return void. Amen. Amen. So Caleb climbs that mountain, and what you see is you see this Israeli spy become an Israeli mountain captor. He becomes a conqueror. And he lives the remaining portions of his life knowing that he conquered. It may have taken him 45 years, but the Bible says, Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? Who shall stand in thy holy place? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart. Yes, sir. Amen. Caleb was on that conquest for 45 years, and I want to tell you, it's only been seven days that I've been on a con I've been on a conquest myself. Well, I've been on a quest, but I haven't conquered it yet. John said it this way in his rendition of the Word of God that no longer do I call you servants. This is him pinning down the words of Jesus Christ. For the servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all that I have, or for all that I have heard from my Father, He said, I have made known to you. We know a lot of biblical characters that have walked with God. But at some point, we've got to take what and how these people worshipped. We've got to take who they worship and how they walked with God, and we've got to apply them into our lives. Amen. Amen. So what does that look like on earth when... When you see somebody, what are some of the characteristics? What are some of the qualities? What, what do you look for? Well, we, we all know how to pinpoint all of the spiritual qualities. You know, they pray in the Spirit for this amount of time, and they fast for this amount of time, and they do all that. Let me ask you this. When you are talking to somebody about Jesus, and you're trying to introduce them to Jesus, do you talk them, to them about what clothes you wear and how separate you live? Is that what Jesus did, or he just did he just show them what the Father looked like? Wow. What are some of the attributes? Well, I started looking for them about seven days ago, to be honest with you, on earth. Not in my personal life. I wanted to look and see if I could find them in, in friends. I wanted to see if I could find those attributes. And people that I serve as pastor. 
I won't say anything negative, but I want to say to, to this group of people that's in this home and to those that are watching, I've not been satisfied with the results that I've seen in the mirror. I've not really been satisfied with the results that I've seen on my cell phone. Last week at 8.47, and this is just a part of where I'm going, last week at 8.47 Eastern Time, I was um, going through a morning routine and I received a, t a couple of phone calls from my brother. I knew if he called me in the morning that it was something special. been praying for my family a whole lot, been really interceding for he and his wife and their kids and my, my dad and my mom. First words out of his mouth were, Ken, they found your dad. They found dad in the pool, unresponsive. So I could hear the chaos in the background, and uh, I ran through the house and I hit every door and I said, "Get up!" Ran to my prayer room. Devastation started setting in storm set in unlike I have ever seen in my entire life. I could hear the resuscitations going on in the background. <laughs> I could hear the EMS workers telling my brother to get away. And he yelled back, no. I've got my brother on the phone. And I said, you put that phone up to dad now. He put, I said, you stick it as close to him as you can. And I prayed every way that I could pray. I said everything that I could possibly say. And I knew surely that because of my walk with God that something miraculous certainly could happen. For some reason, I never felt that release. For some reason, I, I, I didn't get to see that release. Chest compression chest compression after chest compression. I just kept praying. We got Papa D on the other line. Julie did. He and Mama Doe were praying and I could hear them. And when those chest compressions stopped and I didn't hear the words, then I was just trusting that God was going to give to me. In fact, I heard the exact opposite. I heard my brother say something that I never thought he'd say. He said, it just pronounced dad dead. No, 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 not my dad. Not while I'm a thousand miles away. Not, not the one in, in, in all 48 years of my life. Not, not the man that I never heard talk about anybody. For 48 years, I never heard him raise his voice at anybody. For 48 years, I never heard him talk about a quality in somebody that was, was bad. It wasn't even until about three weeks ago that I even understood why he had so much pain in his life. I never heard him call another man a name. I never saw him point his finger at somebody else, and they deserved it, I promise you. I never heard him threaten to kill somebody, and boy, if anybody knew the story, they, they probably deserved it. I never saw him strike another human being. <laughs> to know him was to love him. If you ever needed anything, just let it be known. You didn't even have to ask him for it. Just <laughs> let him see that there was a need. If you needed clothes, if you needed food, if you needed a house to stay, no matter how mean you would be to him, he'd let you stay. Big or small, let my dad find out about it. And he would give himself tirelessly to that. If you needed your lawn mowed, you wouldn't have to ask him. If anything in your house broke down, he's observant of it. He's looking for it. He'd give the rest of his day, much less the rest of his week, just trying to find out and figure out how to, to make that thing work again, how to fix it. He loved his grandkids unlike anything that I've ever seen before. I wrote down a couple of qualities about his life that go along with this message today. He was the most selfless person that I've ever met in my life. 
He knew in every situation how to be present in every person's life. He taught me to attend every event possible that matters to other people and make sure it matters to you. He taught me to see the best in everyone <coughs> and bring it out at all costs. He taught me to go the extra mile. He taught me not to keep two coats in my house when I only need one. He literally taught me how to make every single person a hero when you talk to them or you talk about them. He taught me how to show authentic love and concern, especially when it makes you look weak and other men stronger than you. You never have to tell them. You never have to show them how tough you are. It doesn't cost so much to smile, Ken, and be polite. He literally taught me how to run from trouble. He literally taught me how to protect others. Through his life, he taught me always be, to be observant of everybody around you. Always watch out for the safety of everybody that's around you. He taught me how to treat every single child like it's your child, not to treat them any differently. He taught me with his life how to be early to everything and late to nothing. He taught me with his life how to look out for opportunities and help out people no matter if they deserve it or not. He taught me how to never get tired of investing in others even if they didn't deserve it. He taught me to be loyal. He taught me how to be a friend. He taught me how to spend time with every single person that I can <clears throat> and let them know that their time was, as val was valuable. My dad led by example. He showed me for years <clears throat> how to coach up and not how to coach down. I watched him appreciate the big, the little things in life while everybody else was waiting for the big things in life. I saw him squeeze every moment out of every second of the last 20 years. He taught me a lot about friendship. <laughs> That morning, the most exaggerative surges of pain settled in. And I thought, you know what I'm going to do? This is going to be so overwhelming. I'm going to think back to two, three, four, five handfuls of people, maybe a couple of dozen people that I've walked through egregious levels of pain. I'm going to send them a little text, and I know for sure they're going to be here for me. It was startling whenever I didn't get the, the responses that I wanted. It was heartbreaking as a man that I didn't get the response. I didn't get people calling. I didn't get people sending a whole... Every now and then I'd get a little text. I got so few texts. So few phone calls. I thought about literally several times how my dad would respond. And God reminded me of something that we had preached recently that if you're going to prove your love and your loyalty and your friendship to Jesus, it's not in how many fish that you catch to impress Him. It's whether or not you'll be willing to feed His sheep even when His sheep bite your hand, turn from you and walk the other way. Are you still willing to feed those sheep? Are you still willing to love them when there's absolutely nothing in it for you? And I'm going to be honest with you, this week was the trial of my life, and still is. But I've literally looked back to Papu's life, Leonard Cook's life. And I saw him not being a shepherd as far as the Bible is concerned, but I saw him being a shepherd as far as the world is concerned. And I didn't come know until much later in life how many people bit his hand, turned their back on him, and intentionally wounded he and his family. I never heard him say a negative word. Me? Believe me. If the anointing wasn't here, I'd share with you what has gone through my mind about those people. But apparently it never went through his mind. I've had to pray and I've had to release a lot of people as a result of how I've seen them treat my earthly father. And then I started thinking about my heavenly father. If I can find that many qualities, and this is just scratching the surface, if I can look back over my dad's life and see 
all of these things that have changed my life, <coughs> then surely I can look over this Word of God and find enough about my Heavenly Father. Because I know this, there is nothing in this life right now outside of grotesque sin that I wouldn't do to just sit down and have my dad show up over here in Florida again. I know that if I'm willing to do anything to get my father back here and I know that I can, how much more should I be willing to do anything that I can to get my Heavenly Father to show up and He will? I just allow the qualities of God to permeate in my mind and I start talking about how good our God is and how loyal and how faithful He is and how wonderful He is and no matter what I've done, I'll start bringing the presence of God into my home. You see, if I don't start out my prayer, if my motivation for prayer is anything but relational, then I'm using God. If it's just to get me... <coughs> get me by if it's just to meet my needs if it's just to if it's to do anything else but to commit see if I had a chance to be with my dad again I wouldn't ask him for anything I wouldn't ask him to fix anything in this house but you know what if he was sitting here and he found out <coughs> something was wrong in the house he'd go fix it wonder why we think our God is any different than that if you'll just commune with him and let His Spirit so invade your atmosphere in your life, He'll find those troubled areas in your life. You won't even have to tell Him about them if you don't want to. But He'll fix those struggles in your life. He'll fix those trials in your life. I wish that somebody, while is watching this right now, could just say, I don't know what all this means. I've never had this experience that Pastor Ken's talking about, but if you'll just settle down in the room where I am, where I'm in right now, I won't ask you for anything. I just want relational fellowship. I just want to worship you. I don't want to ask you for anything. And I know if I can just worship you, you can invade every recess of my heart and you can identify every problem. You can identify every leak and every character frailty. I love you, Jesus. I want His presence to be the first thing that I seek in the morning. Am I, am I upset at people I thought were my friends? No. I have gotten upset with myself for thinking that they're friends. I was texting a friend of mine <clears throat> and told him, you know what, I, I really walked this person through and that person through and they were with they were going through divorce, they were going through this, they were going through loss of their family, they were going through, and I started just thinking about all kinds of names. And he said, you know what, seldom are the ones that, he said, the ones that you walk through hell with are seldom the ones that reciprocate that, or seldom are the ones that walk with it through you, with you. But there's a friend that, stick close, that sticketh closer than a brother. And I've learned this in the last seven days, that my dependency upon, <clears throat> upon humanity now is equal to my need for affirmation of humanity. About 46 years of age, two years ago, I lost the need in about 99% of my life to have anybody affirm me. And I'm not being rude, but something shifted in my life, my life on Saturday. I'm about 99% made up my mind that I'm not going to depend upon another human being all of the days of my life. Is that callous? Is that anger? Uh-uh. There's a mountain that I'm after now. And I can't be on top of that mountain called friendship if I'm dependent upon the affirmation, if I'm dependent upon the help, if I'm dependent upon any human being, if they give it to me, I love it. But if they don't, <clears throat> I want to be like Caleb and I want to make sure that I know that there's a mountain that other men have walked on. There's a mountain that other men live on. 
that was the very prophetic vision that God gave to me when he connected me to Papa D, or to David Shadwell. He was on top. I was heading up a mountain, and I'll leave you with this. It was a thick black fog. It was about chest high. It was from my head to my chest. And God allowed me to see that the further that I walk up, the thicker the cloud. And I looked on top of that mountain. For those of you that may not know, my greatest friend, mentor, pastor, the man of God in my life and in this family, the bishop of this church, he literally was on top of that mountain. I'm not telling you something I thought of. I'm telling you a vision that I saw from God. He put his hands in his mouth and whistled. And he pointed and he started waving, come up here. And literally, the Lord spoke to me and said that if you will passionately pursue that man and go after him with everything that is within you, he has not only what you need to get to the top, but he has what you need to live at the top. <clears throat> the top of that mountain is a place of fellowship. The top of that mountain is not a place of productivity. The top of that mountain is, is where intimacy occurs. If you can play something as we get ready to leave right now, I'll preach for quite a long time. It's a lady by the name of Hannah. She was wife to Elkanah, and, and um, Elkanah had another wife named Penina. Hannah wanted to give birth to a child. Elkanah attempts to console her and says, Hey, is not my love... Uh, better to you? Am I not better to you than ten sons? She didn't really say much to him. But she lets all of us know through her actions that she's really uncomfortable being intimacy with Elkanah without being able to conceive and to produce something that comes as a result of that intimacy. She was letting us know that I, that I may enjoy that part of being intimate, but I'd rather leave that thing alone if I can't carry something that's forever going to change my life as a result of that intimacy. I want to be careful that in the days ahead when the doors to the church building open back up, just coming to the altar and feeling good and calling that intimacy is not going to be enough. It's going to be okay for a moment until the next service and you need it again. But Hannah was saying, if I'm going to be intimate with you, I want something to be conceived on the inside of me that will forever change my life. She walks right past Eli, whose sons have done more than drop the ball. He's an undisciplined man who has grown fat on the finances, sitting just outside of the doorpost. She walks right past that undisciplined man. Steps right into the presence of God. Eli thought she had been drinking. But Hannah had become intoxicated upon conceiving something on the inside of her that would forever change her life. She wanted to produce another generation as a result of her intimacy with her husband. You know what I want to do? Same thing. I appreciate the songs and the sermons appreciate all the conferences that I went to in the past and was a part of, but you know really where my life changed and where it still changes? is an intimacy. It's when I worship Him and when I fellowship with Him. It's when I walk with Him. It's when I get in communion with Him and in step with Him until something is conceived on the inside of me as a direct result of that intimacy. And I can carry that with me everywhere that I go. My friend, you were created to worship Him. 
You were created to fellowship with Him. You were created to commune with Him. And that's the one thing that when you sin, so easily you run away from. But no matter where you are right now, I want to encourage you to run back to Him. Because those things that you have created, uh, that you have cut and you have placed in, in your life, those fig leaves, they really don't cover you in His presence. But I want to tell you, love covers a multitude of sin. And if your memories of the Master are just centered around Him being a jealous God and a God of judgment, you really don't know Him. Or maybe you don't remember how He really is. He wants to fellowship with you. He wants to commune with you. All over this place, and for those that are watching, I want you to join me and let's just worship Him. Thank you for being with us today.